into my mouth and the meditations of all our hearts be acceptable in your sight. O Lord, our Rock and our Redeemer. Amen. Amen. Would you like to be seated? So now I come to the eighth of the homilies of the Church of England, and this one is entitled Falling from God. I wonder if, as you think back on your life, you can uh, think of a hobby or an interest that you used to have, that you used to be really enthusiastic about, uh, but now uh, you are no longer as enthusiastic about it. Maybe you don't even do it at all. When I was young, uh, as many of you know, I was a season ticket holder uh, for Tranmere, uh, and then when I moved away, uh, I obviously couldn't make the matches anymore, uh, stopped being a season ticket holder and didn't even really pay attention uh, to what they were doing. Have you uh, had a similar experience of a hobby or an interest that you were really enthusiastic about once, but now uh, you are no longer? Sometimes our faith uh, can be a bit similar to that, particularly uh, for those people for whom uh, faith is just a hobby and not something that uh, takes uh, colours the whole of their life. If church is just something that you turn up to on a Sunday for a couple of hours uh, at most, uh, then it's easy uh, for it to just become like a hobby and something that you'd lose enthusiasm, enthusiasm about. Faith uh, can sometimes uh, be something that we uh, dwindle in our enthusiasm for. We can turn away from God. And we can turn away from God uh, in a number of ways. We can do it by uh, direct kind of idolatry. We can turn uh, to other things uh, as gods in our lives. It might be uh, converting to a different religion or it might just be having a different philosophical outlook or a different ideology that uh, takes over uh, your life. It might be concentrating on things like politics uh, and thinking of that as a solution to the world's problems. We can turn away from God by putting something else in his place, uh, using uh, being idolatrous. And idolatry is one of the big themes of the book of Hosea that we had our first reading from. All the way through that book, God is uh, talking to the people of Israel and saying how they've fallen away from him, how they've turned to other gods instead of him. And in uh, chapter 14, uh, we have those words uh, reported of the people of Israel that they turned to things that their own hands had made and called them our God. And uh, they also, uh, when they are called back to repentance, uh, they lay aside their other idols in order to follow God again. So sometimes we can turn away from God uh, through idolatry by putting something else in his place. Or we could turn away from him through a lack of faith or a mistrusting of him, where we try to do things ourselves in our own strength rather than relying on him and his promises. Sometimes uh, that can be about uh, salvation, where we don't trust God's promises uh, to save us through the death of Jesus, and instead we try and earn our salvation by doing good works. We've heard in the previous homilies how futile that is. But sometimes we have a lack of faith or a lack of trust in God and we try and do things in our own strength. And that's again what Hosea is pointing out to the people of Israel, uh, where they turned to Assyria, the superpower of the time, in order to save and defend them uh, in battle. And so, when they turn back to the Lord, they say, Assyria cannot save us, we will not mount war horses. They won't take things into their own hands, they won't rely on other powers for their protection. They will instead trust in God and his promises that he will save them, uh, and they don't need 
to turn uh, to Assyria and they don't need to go into battle themselves without God. So we can turn away through idolatry or through a mistrust of God or we can neglect his commands. Uh, last, in the last homily we looked at the subject of Christian love and how we as followers of Jesus are to imitate him in his love. And we also heard about those two commandments that he gave, love the Lord our God with all our heart, soul, mind and strength and love our neighbour as ourself. God calls us to true justice and compassion and sometimes we neglect those commands. Another part of what uh, God is saying through Hosea to the people of Israel is about this lack of love for their neighbour where uh, their lives have been full of cursing and lying and stealing and murder and adultery and dishonesty how they've neglected the commands of God for justice and compassion and we too can be similar where we don't think about God's commandments we don't live out those commandments in our life we live for ourselves and not for our neighbours so we can turn away uh, from God through idolatry through mistrusting him uh, through neglecting his commands and all of these are linked uh, through uh, one concept and that is ignoring the word of God it's turning away from the things that God tells us in his word about him being the only God about him being trustworthy about his commands uh, for the way he wants us to live our lives and so they're all linked by that turning away from and ignoring the word of God and instead following our own persuasions and the stubbornness of our own hearts in chapter 14 in verse 9 uh, we are told the ways of the Lord are right the righteous walk in them but the rebellious stumble in them the ways of the Lord are right and we are to walk in his ways as he tells us through his word but if we don't we start stumbling and the root of this turning away from God and ignoring the word of God is a sense of pride the original sin the first thing that caused us to turn away from God that caused Adam to turn away from God was that pride that sense that we know better than God and we all have that pride within us. The third century biblical scholar Origen said that those who listen to God, to the word of God, those who embrace it, who print it on their hearts, who fashion their life around it, are those who are turned towards God. But those who listen to fables and tales rather than the word of God or when they hear the word of God are distracted by worldly business or money, or they live their lives for worldly honour and glory, those are the ones who are turned away from God. It's about how we respond to the word of God, as we see in the parable of the sower. What does the word of God do in us? Is it snatched away? Does it bear fruit for a little bit? or does it bear uh, full fruit and produce a crop? How do we respond to the word of God? How do we respond when we hear it in church, when it's being read out or when it's being expounded in the sermons? Are we listening to it or are we being distracted by other things? Are we thinking about all the other things we have to do uh, in the day or the week? coming up. Of course, uh, listening to the word of God uh, being explained is not always an easy task. It's hard uh, if the speaker is not engaging, but we should all be keen to be putting the effort into listening, 
because we should be desiring the word of God more than anything. We should be desiring to hear from God, to listen to what he's saying so that we can put it into practice in our lives. We should be keen to put the effort in to hear from God because otherwise uh, that pride will come in. Otherwise we're thinking that we are better and know more than God. And sometimes that pride makes us disobey God's word, uh, but in a way uh, that we are claiming to do something that is more honouring to God instead. In the Old Testament, uh, Saul is given a commandment from God uh, to kill all the cattle uh, from the Amalekite tribe. Saul decides that he's not going to kill all of the cattle, but instead saves the best ones so that he can sacrifice them on the altar for God. He thinks that that is a better use of that cattle uh, in that uh, sacrifice to God. But God, through his prophet, tells Saul off for doing that. He says, why did you disobey my word? I told you to destroy them all, but you didn't. You kept some back for that sacrifice. And so uh, Saul faces the punishment uh, that God says he will no longer be king, that God has uh, rejected him as king of Israel. Saul thought he was doing something better for God, but in doing so he disobeyed the word of God. We see a similar thing in our time with the discussions about whether the church should uh, perform same-sex marriages, even though the word of God is against doing it. Some people think that it would be uh, a good thing to do because it would be fulfilling that command to love our neighbour. It would be a reflection of our belief that God is love. But they want to do something that goes against the word of God, even though they're pretending that it's something that is honouring to God. So turning away from God, uh, is, the root cause of it is a pride, is uh, a, th a thought that we can we know better than God and therefore we don't need to listen to his word anymore. But if we turn away from God, God will turn away from us too. And he does this in a couple of ways. The first one is by showing us his frightening face. It's about uh, bringing his wrath down upon us. And the second way is by hiding his face from us, by forsaking us and leaving us. But before he does, does those things, before he shows his frightening face or hides his face from us, he first shows us his merciful face. He sends us preachers to remind us of the mercy that he shows us in Jesus, that though we are still sinners, Christ dies for us, and he dies for us so that we can be reconciled to God and made his children. And because of that, we have a duty to be conformed to him. That true and lively faith means that the Spirit works in us, conforming us to his likeness. That is the mercy that God shows to us in Jesus. And these preachers also remind us and warn us of the consequences of not uh, following uh, the ways of God, not being conformed to him. That if we do not follow, we will not enter the kingdom of heaven. So God shows his merciful face to us uh, by encouraging us and warning us and reminding us what he's done for us in Jesus. But if that doesn't work, he will then show his frightening face to us. He will bring his wrath upon us. Things like war and famine and plagues, and perhaps even in our day we might uh, include climate change. All these things could be ways that God is bringing his wrath upon us, punishing us 
for our sins, for our turning away from him. But if his wrath doesn't work, then he hides his face from us. He withdraws his word. He withdraws right doctrine. He withdraws his assistance and his aid. And he leaves us to our own wisdom and will and strength. He permits us to run headlong into the pleasures of the world. And Jesus gives us a great image of that in his parable uh, of the prodigal son, where the prodigal son takes uh, the wealth of his father and squanders it uh, on high living, on parties uh, and on things he shouldn't be spending it on. In that story, he rushes headlong into the pleasures of this world. And those who are unbelievers think that this is a great thing, the freedom to do whatever they want to do. That is what they think true happiness is about. But the parable of the prodigal son reminds us that soon those pleasures fade, soon uh, the money runs out and those things, uh, those friends who are attracted because of the parties uh, soon go away. It is not a great freedom to be able to do whatever it is we want to do because that freedom will inevitably lead us to doing the wrong things. It's a dreadful thing to be left to our own devices, to left to pursue whatever it is we want to do. It is a dreadful thing for God to withdraw himself from us. If we think about uh, the gardeners, when they've got a plant that they want to keep, they will spend a lot of time and effort in feeding it, giving it good things, and also in pruning it, in taking away uh, the bad things. The gardener spends a lot of effort in the plants that they want to keep. But when, a far, when the gardener stops looking after a plant, when he stops feeding it, when he stops pruning it, when he just leaves it uh, to, uh, to its own devices, that is when he has stopped caring about it. That is when he thinks that plant is no longer worth the effort, that he will get no benefit from that care. It's a dreadful thing when God does that to us, when he leaves us to our own devices, when he decides that it is not worth his effort uh, to put into us uh, that aid and assistance. No wonder the psalmist says, cast me not away from your presence and take not your Holy Spirit from me. It is a dreadful thing for God to hide his face from us. It's bad for unbelievers, but it's even worse for Christians who fall away. We who have had the grace and benefits of knowing Jesus and knowing God's merciful face. We have had the grace and benefit of the Holy Spirit working in our lives. We who have seen that merciful face of God. How dreadful is it when we turn away from God and do not hear his calls to return to him. And so he eventually turns his face from us too. And we become like unbelievers. We shouldn't misread the parable of the prodigal son like unbelievers might do. That, uh, we, that the message that they think it says is that you can do whatever you like because God will forgive you in the end. God will forgive me because that's his job. They need to hear of the judgment that there is for those who turn away from God and don't follow him. They need to hear of the need for repentance. But Christians who fall away need to hear of God's mercy too. If we turn back, he will forgive. So if we are falling away because of idolatry or because of a lack of faith or trust in God or because we're neglecting his commands, 
if we are ignoring God's word because we think we know better before God turns his frightening face to us or before he, he hides his face from us let us see in Jesus' parable of the prodigal son that father longing to embrace his son the father longing to see the son come back to him in repentance so that he can forgive and restore let us heed those words that God brings through Hosea return O Israel to the Lord your God and let us hear God's promises if we do that I will forgive their waywardness and love them freely.